So just real quick, so we started this meetup in January of this year, and we went from having just under 100 members to 791. And our collective mission with this meetup is to elevate the HR and recruiting industry and take us from beyond being the order takers in the organization. So we believe that organizations should have a talent first strategy because as you all are aware, your company is only as good as the people that you have in it. Okay. I started in the corporate world and through that I had many incredible experiences. Uh, Fortune 500 companies moved all over Manhattan, um, Boston, uh, back to Seattle, in the Midwest and with any experience it was ups and downs. Good paying salary, great people. Um, there's also a ton of stories that I'm not ready to tell yet, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we speak from our scars, not our open wounds. So some of them are still open wounds for me, so I'm not ready to share. Um, but with that, I left corporate, and it was right after we bought a house about two years ago, and I had to go find myself. And this was what my husband looked like when I told him I was leaving my corporate job and going to a nonprofit. He freaked out and he said, I support you finding yourself, but did you have to do it on a third of your salary? So we'll talk a lot about money tonight as well, because I think that's um, just something that we need to address when we talk about maybe being in a current situation that we might have to leave and how that is a barrier of what we're up against. Um, so at the time I did leave and yes, my husband was spooked, but I felt like I had to follow my heart. And for me, my passion is animal welfare. So animals are a big part of my life. My first child, it was a golden retriever and I still have him, his name's Buddy, he's five years old. I now have added a, a two-year-old son to the mix, but Buddy is still my first and maybe favorite, depending on the day. <laughs> um, so I went into animal welfare and this is an Instagram pic that I pulled. I'm sitting on the, you can't see this, but uh, this was, she was, her name was Big Mama, and she was this massive pity who snored incredibly loud. And um, my little quote here, trading in corporate heels for nonprofit waterproof chucks, was my life for a few years. Uh, I am loud, I'm opinionated. And at the time, I was having a, I had a male CEO who was white, middle-aged, and entitled. And so when I got there, I had opinions and I didn't go with the status quo. I was different from the other managers that just said, yep, that sounds good. So he would start to say things like, you always have something to say. And in the beginning I was like, yeah, I do always have something to say. And it was a point of pride for me. And then it started to become kind of contentious. I'd raise my hand in a meeting and he'd say things like, why don't you just agree with the group? Ooh, right? He said in front of a meeting at one point, you're difficult. Hmm, all right. Um, and also, you're too loud and opinionated, which I personally find, again, really proud of, right? So this is what I'm up against. I'm still being loud, I'm still being opinionated. I'm not changing myself, but this is the environment that I'm working in. So clearly, I'm the black sheep, and I'm not willing to change. So with that comes this. This is my pregnancy announcement. And then everything changed. I started to get treated differently. I was in a, a male dominated field and you have to think at the time too in a nonprofit, we have about 200 non-paid staff. They're all volunteers, right? So what does that mean? There's no governance on them. You don't have anyone to go to to say, hey, a volunteer did something inappropriate. And not only that, when your CEO is the one who's telling you that you're too opinionated and now discriminating against me because I'm pregnant, I have nowhere to go. So, as I got farther along in my pregnancy, I started to hear comments like this. Sit down, stop walking around too much. When do you go on leave? You look too big. You're so pregnant, you're making me uncomfortable. It was literally, on the daily, these are the comments that I heard. I actually ended up going on leave, gosh, 37 weeks pregnant, which is, as anyone knows, three weeks before your due date, because I just couldn't stand it anymore. It wasn't worth it for me to be in that type of environment. I couldn't put myself through that stress, knowing that I was about to have my first child. So I call my HR department um, when my leave is ending, and I say, okay, I'm ready to come back. And she says this, your job has been eliminated. Is that illegal? Yeah. Yep, huh, it is, it's illegal. 
Um, she said, you can come back in a lesser role, um, but the job you had before has been eliminated. And she says to me, and this is an HR mind you, she says to me, we couldn't assume that you were going to come back to work. Mind you, I had given her no reason to think that I wasn't coming back to work at all. So during that time, I, um, to be honest with you, I, I, I sought counsel. I got one of the best counsel in Seattle and they thought I had a case. And um, at the end of the day, I decided not to pursue it because it was going to have to put my family through a lot of time. It would take years and years and years and the outcome might not necessarily not be worth it. Um, so I chose to drop it. And it's probably one of my biggest regrets to date. Um, but at the same time, I don't regret that experience because it brought me to another point of, I like the word serendipity. Do you guys know the word serendipity? Yeah, serendipitous, like everything happens at the right time, right? Love the movie too. So it brought me to thank the universe for being too opinionated. I say that every day because it brought me to here. I now work at Rational um, Consulting. We just split off, it was Rational Interaction at the time. Um, I saw a job posting and they said, we're looking for a poodle with a mohawk. And I was like, that's me, I'm a poodle with a mohawk. And I talked to Rebecca Weaver, who's actually my co-founder of HR Uprise, and we just clicked and it worked. And I came on board and I quickly realized that it was different. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know if you've met these people, but in the interview with Rebecca, I didn't tell her why I left my other company, and I'm sure you guys have all had that experience, right? Because we're not necessarily believed, so you kind of hold some of that information back. I didn't tell Rebecca, um, but within, gosh, a week, two weeks of me being there, we started sharing our own Me Too stories and being honest about why we left our previous employers, and she had a very similar experience. So we knew we were on to something. That was the beginning of HR Uprise. Then, this happened again, right? Toronto Burke started it back in 2009, don't quote me. And then Alyssa Milano made it popular again. What was happening at Rational during this time is we had a pretty uh, high profile sexual harassment case with someone that we call a rainmaker. Do you guys know what a rainmaker is? Yeah. So they bring in a shit ton of money to your organization. So this person was in our sales department and had just closed a $3 million deal and was the single point of contact on the account. So when these allegations came out, due to my previous experience, I was concerned to bring them forward. So we did our due diligence. We confirmed that there was indeed some very egregious harassment that happened. And a turning point for us is when I brought that information to our executive leadership team and they said, what do you want to do, Nick? It's up to you, we want to do it right. And that wasn't something that I had ever encountered. I thought I was gonna to have to go into battle and I was armored up and I was all ready to say like, even though he brings in $3 million, we have to do this, does it have to do right? Not a question. What are we gonna do? We gotta make it right. So after that, I was like, okay, I'm home, this is great. And after that, we also did something quite different. We termed him and we let everyone know that we termed him. And we didn't send out that email that said, he's pursuing other opportunities. We said we termed him. Mind you, we framed it for anyone who's legal in the audience. We didn't say he was termed for sexual harassment. There's ways around that. But we didn't lie to our employees. And we said that we termed him. And shortly after that, we had what was called a, um, a Me Too uh, meetup. And we had people come in and just discuss what do you want to talk about in the wake of Me Too? What makes you uncomfortable? What makes you question the workplace? And mind you, it's an advertising agency, right? So the type of work that they do every day, they're looking at um, certain images and presenting ads that they're like, what is appropriate and what's not? The conversations to be had. So it's, it's quite a unique situation. And so we created this forum for them to ask, what is okay and what's not? Those conversations that might be spoken about amongst peers, but not to us, we gave them that forum to do so. So that was kind of step one. Then this came out. So time person of the year, it was all these amazing people who were part of the Me Too movement. And what moved us the most was all these incredible people who were able to speak out. But here's this elbow, because this person represents everyone who's not ready to put their voice to this story. And this happens more so than not, right? This is the tip of the iceberg, and this is everything that's underneath it. So this compelled us to say, it's not enough, we have to do more. Even though people are coming forward, how many people aren't coming forward? And what can we do to change that? Then Oprah happened, because Oprah always happens. Um, 
So at the Golden Globes, this was, this was a year where we didn't just talk about fashion. And don't get me wrong, I love fashion. Um, but we didn't just talk about fashion, right? We talked about something different. And her speech had everybody saying, Oprah for president, da da da. But Oprah really inspired Rebecca and I were literally like on the phone being like, ah, for Oprah for president, what do we do? Oh my gosh, we have to do something. Where is this for business? And we kept asking herself, where is this for business? So Oprah really inspires everything that we do. But Oprah happened. And then this happened. Did you guys see this New York Times? Yes, so good. You can't see the text, but this came out and it says, the truth has a voice. He said, she said, he said, she said, and the rest said, she said. Which means believe the one voice, right? Which we don't do. And what was interesting about this is this was put on Rebecca and I's desk um, by one of our executive leaders. And we thought, all right. Now it's time, giddy up, we gotta do something about this. Still HR Uprise hadn't, hadn't come about yet. How many headlines have you seen, again, as this is going on, HR is not your friend and here's why. Come on, have we seen those? Uh-huh, yep. This has started way back, but this started a resurgence again. If HR is not your friend, don't go to HR, they're protecting the company, and all this was coming out. And I have to tell you, Rebecca and I didn't disagree. We didn't disagree. We felt like there was an element of us being complicit in this situation, and that was really hard to own, and it was incredibly uncomfortable, but when we both said it out loud that HR has been complicit, we knew we had to act. So, whoa, this is really dramatic, all right. Um, <laughs> HR needs its soul back. So we created HR Uprise, and it literally just started as an Instagram channel. And we kind of put up a test balloon of, is this something that anyone's gonna react to? We thought it was gonna be more for an HR audience. And we really wanted to reach our HR peers who maybe were in the same situation of us and feeling like they wanted to change the dynamics in the organization, but they didn't know how. And so we got to this, HR doesn't need defending, it needs a revolution. And it took off and it got crazy and it got like a thousand followers in two days and it was insane and we weren't expecting that and um, we had a ton of learnings from that. And what I would love to share with you in the meat of this presentation is what we've learned from HR Uprise and what you guys can bring back to your organizations and do about that. So the first one is, it's time to get uncomfortable. What does that mean? Um, my spin instructor at City Cycle uh, yells this at me all the time, like, get uncomfortable, get uncomfortable. But here's what it means for us. In the workplace, we need to, if we aren't able to get uncomfortable in our own skin, how do we inspect our employees to do the same thing? So do you listen to podcasts that make you cringe and say, oh gosh, this is talking about me being white and I feel so uncomfortable and I don't wanna listen to this, I'm gonna turn it off. Or um, it's talking about uh, your entitlement or it's talking about how you have an unconscious bias towards people of color. All these things that make you uncomfortable, if you don't do that, how can you expect your people to do it? So you need to have the courage to get uncomfortable. Read a book that you wouldn't normally read. Listen to a podcast that you wouldn't normally read. We are in the era of free information and it's everywhere. So lead by example in this, in this situation is getting uncomfortable. Make it easier to talk about hard things. Do you guys remember when um, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain committed suicide? And both of those were incredibly devastating to me. I had followed both of their careers for a long time. And during that time, we had a point of self-reflection where Rebecca and myself sent out an email to our entire staff sharing that we have both suffered at some point in our life with depression and anxiety. And we just shared it with everyone. And we said, in the wake of everything that's going on, we would like to be really candid with you about our own struggles. And we would like to invite you to share yours as well confidentially or publicly, give you a forum to do it, and here's also your resources to help. You have no idea the amount of responses that we got. It was incredibly overwhelming for us to be vulnerable and to share that as a leader was super surprising, also incredibly awkward and uncomfortable, right? And to, to say that as a leader, you're supposed to be stoic and nothing's wrong and you have the answers, and to say, guess what, I have anxiety, guess what, I've struggled with depression, and to put that out there to your staff they respected us 10 times more, and it really opened up a lot of conversation, so I would encourage you to do the same. Again, open the conversation. This could be something as simple as, we have something called AMA, or Ask Me Anything, it's a Google forum where people could say, 
submit anonymously any questions that they want. Um, so believe it or not, we had a second high profile sexual harassment case shortly after the first one. We we're like, all right, here we go, me too, V2, let's all get in a room. Um, but what we did that time is we sent out um, an anonymous survey beforehand and we said, ask us your questions that you want us to say in the room that you want answers to because we wanna create this this uh, mutual rules of engagement amongst each other that's not in this handbook and this policy. So they asked questions and we gave them a forum to open up the conversation. And some of the questions that we got were quite surprising. It was, can I tell you that your hair looks nice? Is that sexual harassment? Um, I feel like I have a relationship where I can hug one of my colleagues. Is that inappropriate? What if it happens on the weekend? Um, we work in advertising and we look at people with you know, short shorts and sometimes cleavage. What do I do in those situations? And what we did, again, is provide a forum and have the audience answer those questions. And it was so incredible, because literally, when we walked out of the room, they all had these rules that they were holding each other accountable for, and we didn't have to do anything. And they still, to this day, hold each other accountable to those rules. So it's just creating those spaces for them. Shift your thinking. I, I, I love this one. Um, how many of you in this room interview for jobs? Yeah, you're all interviewers, right? Okay. So if you as an interviewer aren't creating a safe space for them to have those conversations and to be believed, shift your thinking. I'm gonna, I was telling Kelly I was, Kelly was gonna do this. Um, my current HRBP is moving back home, which is incredibly sad, but because of that, I've been doing interviews for her role. And just two days ago during an interview, I had someone share their Me Too story with me and I almost cried because I felt so honored that she felt safe enough to have that conversation with me and not feel judged. So shift your thinking and how do you do that? What is everything that you have traditionally thought? Do they need a certification to do the job? I can talk about certifications all day. Um, I don't think you do, but um, shift your thinking, right? Everything that you think you knew, shift your thinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The other thing we want to talk about is uh, traditional uh, training, right? So what does that mean? So that means that, what's the definition of uh, insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, that traditional sexual harassment training that we usually have, guess what happens? It reinforces the stereotypes that the men are the aggressors and the women are the victims, and it doesn't work. So we need to shift to something called ally training. Because this guy, we're not going to change him. He's still going to be who he is. And by the way, he's the president of the United States. Not to get to political, but I'm going there. Who we're going after is this guy, Billy Bush, who sat on the bus and giggled like a schoolgirl at his disgusting comments about women, right? Could you imagine if Billy Bush said, that's disgusting, stop it. He wouldn't have gone on. So that's who we're going after. We're going after Billy Bush. So I would say look at ally training, don't look at your sexual harassment training, because it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. There's a ton of resources out there that we have on our website that are free, that allow you to do a ton of different ally trainings. Um, first off, we need to focus more on what I call civility. And what that means is, what does good behavior look like versus focusing on the behavior that we don't want to see? So that's a, how do you be respectful to people? Um, so I have a huge thing on, on civility training. The other thing is the bystander training. So yes, we absolutely need to create an environment where people feel comfortable coming forward to say that this person has harassed me and for us to act accordingly when we have collaborated and believed the lone voice that this person has done something wrong. Um, and we need to make sure that this person here speaks up. And I have to tell you, you're gonna get it wrong. I've had so many stories of, of, of men, and, and by the way, when we talk about this, we talk about men um, being the harassers just because that's just statistics, right? But it doesn't mean that women can't also be the harassers. They absolutely can. It's just that men are typically um, more prone to do that from statistics. But to answer your question, it's twofold. We need to empower them. And I had this one guy tell me, I'm just going to say one word. And I'm like, okay, what are you going to say? He's like, I'm going to say, if someone says inappropriate, I'm going to say, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what's that going to do? He's like, I think it's just going to allow me to say, whoa. I'm like, okay. And he started doing it. And he did it wrong sometimes. But at least he like, made the other person go, why are you saying whoa? And he was like, oh, I feel uncomfortable. And then it kind of allowed him to say what was next, right? So whether it's one word and just know we're going to mess it up, HR is all about like, let's do it right, let's do it by the book, we gotta be right. 
it's okay, we can mess up, but we just have to try, we have to try something different. So we have to empower the allies, we have to talk about what to do right, and we need to address it when the situation comes up that someone has harassed. Oh, stop lying to your employees. Um, you may not know that you're lying to your employees, but you are. So show of hands of how many people have um, sent out a message that said, so-and-so is pursuing opportunities outside of the company. You know you've sent it, yeah you did. Um, we call it the poo message, and it's, uh, it's a lie to your employees. <laughs> so uh, many of our um, lawyer friends tell us, stop talking about this, but we're not going to stop talking about this. Stop lying, be honest, tell them that they left the organization, that we made the decision to term them. I think in this, um, in this type of um, very highly uh, politically charged environment that your leaders as well as ourselves need to take a stand on what's appropriate and what's not. And if people don't agree with it, that's okay. Um, but at least your employees know where you stand and what you believe in. So if we say this person termed and that behavior is not acceptable, then they know where you stand. I can tell you that that's gonna make them feel more comfortable coming forward as well. Um, and I personally like to challenge the belief that your leaders are the ones that create the culture. Sure, they can say they want a culture that's X and our values are this, but really when they're gone and they leave the building and how our employees make decisions and how they treat each other, that's really the culture. And so I call it climate. So climate creates culture and climate is all the interactions that you have with your immediate surroundings, eventually those add up to culture, right? Um, so I would empower your employees to create a positive climate which then leads to culture. Um, culture is so, so ambiguous and sometimes esoteric to people, but really I would say it's not, it's not your perks. Um, it truly is that shared consciousness of your employees' behavior and how they make decisions when you're not around. This, if you follow HR Uprise, this is probably one of the um, most commented on posts that we've ever got. Um, and it says, truth, the notion of bringing your authentic self to work is kind of bullshit. My authentic self will get me fired. Um, and it's true, right? Like, how many of us have said that? And <clears throat> I have since changed my thinking on this a little bit. There's an um, a author by the name of Cy Wakeman. Has anyone heard of Cy Wakeman? Okay. She's right up there with Brene Brown for me. And she talks about bringing your most evolved self to work um, because your authentic self might be an asshole. So bring your evolved self to work. Um, but we need to be able to create a space for your evolved self to be there, right? So have you had a conversation where you tell a woman that she's too emotional and she needs to calm it down? Have you had that conversation? Have you had a conversation where you've talked to a person of color and said, ooh, I need you to change the language to this. You know why you're doing that? You're doing that to make the majority around you feel comfortable and we need to stop that. We need to create an environment where people can be their most evolved selves. So question the conversations that you're having with people to fit into the status quo. I like to say that HR is oftentimes the story keepers and not the storytellers, and it's time for us to tell our story. We have so much to say, and we're oftentimes said that uh, we have to be confidential, we have to be this, and yes, that's a part of our job, but it doesn't mean that we can't share our own Me Too stories. It doesn't mean that we can't share our own gender discrimination stories. It doesn't mean that we can't also share that we've suffered from anxiety and depression. It doesn't mean that we can't be open with that at our employees. This also isn't going away. This is the norm. So think about this, Uber, blog press, blog, press interviews. I might have been watching too much West Wing last night because it was all about the press. Um, but Uber, who went to the press, right? They had the blog. Nike, they, the women did an internal survey without HR involved. Over 250 women took this internal survey, put it on the executive's desk and said, look, we're being harassed and look what happened out of it, right? Civil lawsuit. Google, walkouts, demands to executives. They're taking out their arbitration cause because of these employees. I will tell you, this isn't the exception, this is the rule. This is happening now. With, with, with social media, with all the access to information, if we don't do it, our employees will. This is what we don't have the right to remain silent. We just don't. Bad for business, bad for us, bad for our employees. They not only deserve more, but they expect more. What can you control? This always comes up about how much control does HR actually have? Um, you know, oh, we don't have control, our execs have control, or this, that, and the other. I think we have more control than we think. 
Um, and what we have control over is sometimes if we allow ourselves to continue to be a part of that toxic environment. That's what I think we have control over. Um, so I would in, I encourage you all, if you can, if you're in a toxic environment where you don't feel like you can make these changes, leave. I know it sounds easier than possible, but, but leave. Yeah, and it's time for us to start speaking up. So what that means is get up here, tell your stories. Tell your stories to your employees. Again, be open and, and vulnerable and brave. Do you guys know who Brene Brown is? Yeah. Yes, okay. She's like I told some of you before, she's a, a bucket list item for me and I'm flying to Austin, Texas um, for the Together Live Tour to see Brene Brown on Monday and I'm flipping out. Um, so it's time to start speaking up. Everybody has a voice and you need to use it. Whether you think you have a platform or not, use it. This is also, again, one of my favorite quotes, but share from your scars, not your wounds. So when it's time and that's healed, that's when you know you're ready to share your stories. I'm, I'm on this journey of being woke. Have you guys heard about that? Like, woke, yeah. Um, I'm not there yet because it's a process, but I think for those of us who are on this journey of woke, we have a responsibility to share that with others. So you feeling confident by saying, hey, your hair looks great, lead by example in that, right? And when you hear someone saying it creepy, like, your hair looks nice. <laughs> That's when you'd say, ooh, that's weird, right? And that's where you would stand up as a confident person and be like, ooh. Maybe you could be like, whoa. Maybe that's your word, right? <laughs> but that's a great question. All right. Yeah. Um, also, you guys, uh, Nicolette at hruprice.com. Feel free to email me. Go on our site. Sign up for newsletters. But um, I'd love to chat with you all after. So reach out. Thank you. That was really awesome. Thank I don't you. know about you guys, but Thank you. yeah.